I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I said, man, this guy is solid and, uh, and just a, a great communicator. Today, would you do me a favor? Would you stand to your feet and give the Lord a great big praise as Pastor Robert Madu comes to deliver the word of the Lord to us today? Robert, come tell us about Jesus. Today. Oh, come on, Rock. You could do better than that. Come on, this is the day that the Lord has made. Come on, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Are there really glad people in the house today? Hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, don't get comfortable. You might be back up again. Come on. <laughs> is anybody really excited to be in the house of God today? I'm telling you. I, uh, I say this all the time, but it certainly rings true today. I'm not just excited to be here. I am Red Bull excited, espresso elated. I have been waiting with tiptoe anticipation for this service just to get my chocolate face into place. This is, <laughs> I'm telling you, this is a phenomenal church. I did not raise my hand, Pastor Dan said, if you're a first time guest, because I just got baptized in the family Friday night with the men. Saturday morning, we had such an awesome time. So you, you got a cousin from Dallas, Texas named Robert Madu. And uh, I'm telling you, this is not just a preacher and pulpit platitude. It has been amazing just to come into this church and see that all that God is doing here. Um, I'm a young man of God, but I'm not too young to know that uh, great churches are not really determined by their seating capacity. Uh, great churches are determined by their serving capacity. And when I see the way this church faithfully serves this community, come on, how many know you're blessed to be a part of the rock? I'm telling you, the, the grass don't get greener anywhere else. You at the right place at the right time. And it's just amazing to see what God is doing here. And, and certainly to God be all the glory. But God always uses people. He always uses leaders who say yes to the call. So I want to thank God for your pastors, for who they are. Come on, for Pastor Dan and for Jessica. Come on, I think they're the best of the best. I just met them. Come on, but I think you are ridiculously blessed to have them as your leaders. And come on, while you're clapping, your founding pastor who's in the house today, who is a living legend. I'm telling you, Pastor Jim just comes in the room and I just feel better about myself. He's just amazing. And uh, man, we've been having a great time. I'm believing God's going to do great things. Uh, as was mentioned, I am from the great country of Texas. Uh, <laughs> I have lived in Dallas my entire life. I'm married to the finest woman on the planet. Uh, we've been married now for four years, six months, nine days, eight minutes, and 32 seconds. And uh, <laughs> she, is, uh, she is so kind, especially in this season of our lives, to let me travel and, and do what God has called uh, me to do. She is at home with our two kids. We have a two-year-old daughter, a one-year-old son. Uh, so we're rookie parents, to say the least. And you know how some rookie parents are. As soon as they become parents, they think their kid's the most beautiful kid in the world. I always put up pictures of their kid because they think everybody want to see their kid. I'm not that dad. I made a vow to not be that dad. So you got to worry about me putting my kids on the screen. This is about me preaching Jesus, not you seeing my children. So we good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We good. We're good. That's not true. Can you put my kids on every screen up in here? Hey, rock church. I made that. Okay. That is, uh, on the left, that is my baby girl. That is my baby girl, Everly Adair Madu. We call her Evie. She is the reason that I pray more and I have a shotgun. And then <laughs> on the right is my son. He just turned one. My man child, Robert Madu the third. My legacy, my namesake. So, uh, man, I, I put up their pictures everywhere I go because fatherhood is the best hood. There's nothing like being a dad. Where are all the dads at? Make some noise. It's awesome. So, uh, hey, we're going to have fun in here today. Are you ready for the word of God? Come on, this is the first service. This is the spiritual crowd. I know you're ready for the word. I want to turn your attention today to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2. And I also want to look at 1 Samuel 18 verses 5 through 9. I was telling the service Saturday, I don't think I've ever been uh, more passionate about a message and what I'm about to share with you today is that God has given me a mandate to preach this word everywhere that I go. And I believe it is a word for this season, for this time. And I hope you got an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. Hebrews chapter 12, 
verses 1 and 2, and then 1 Samuel 18, 5 through 9. Once you got Hebrews chapter 12, why don't you say, yeah. yeah. If you're still looking for it and you need a little bit more time, say, hold up. All right, I'm going to give you some time. Take your time. <laughs> Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. What an awesome thought to consider that God has set a race before each and every one of us and we are required to run that race. How do we do it? The writer of Hebrews tells us we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Can you say amen? Come on. That is good stuff. First Samuel 18 verses 5 through 9, and I'm reading from Eugene Peterson's message translation, and it says, whatever Saul gave David to do, he did it, and did it well. So well that Saul put him in charge of his military operations. Everybody, both the people in general and Saul's servants, approved of and admired David's leadership. As they returned home after David had killed the Philistine, the women poured out of all of the villages of Israel, singing and dancing, welcoming King Saul with tambourines, festive songs, and lutes. I'm not really sure what a lute is, but I'm assuming it's like a flute without the F. And <laughs> profound, I know. And it says, in playful frolic, in playful frolic. Come on, Rock Church. You know it's a party when people are taking the time to frolic, okay? And play for frolic. The women sang, listen to what they sang. Saul is killed by the thousand. David by the ten thousand. This made Saul angry. Very angry. He took it as a personal insult. He said, huh. I'm actually adding the huh. Huh. They credit David with ten thousands, but me with only thousands? For you know it, they'll be giving him the kingdom. From that moment on, Saul kept his eye on David. Ooh, I don't want to preach before I preach, so don't count this as my preaching time. But I do want you this morning to look at these two verses of Scripture in parallel. Because here we have the writer of Hebrews who says, hey, there's a race that's been set before each and every one of us. And we run the race by keeping our eyes on who? Jesus. But here we have Saul Simply because of a comparison that these ladies made between him and David, no longer is he focused on his destiny or running his race, but comparison is so strong, it caused Saul to focus all of his attention, all of his energy on David. Ooh, I want to preach today, not long, probably about six and a half hours, <clears throat> just using this as, as a title, On Their Mark. If you're taking notes today, get that down. If you're not taking notes, get that down. <laughs> on their mark. I realize when you're running a race, they say, get on your mark. But I'm finding many people in the body of Christ cannot run the race God has set before them simply because they have their eyes on the people in the lanes beside them. So instead of being on your mark, you're on. Ooh, this is going to be good in here today. I'm telling you, I preached it to myself this morning in the hotel room. You're about to be blessed. Come on, would you bow your heads? And let's pray and let's ask God to speak to us. Father, thank you for your word. God, I'm cognizant of the fact that the grass withers, the flower fades, but your word shall stand forever. Holy Spirit, speak to us today. We're not gathered here today out of religious routine. We've not come here today to be entertained. We have come to be drastically changed. Speak to us so clearly, so succinctly. And when we leave, let us say it was so good to have been in the presence of Jesus. And somebody who loves Jesus, say amen. Oh, come on, say amen again. Yeah. On their mark. A quick little sermonic survey before we delve into this today. How many of you would say, just by a showing of hands, that you like to work out? You enjoy exercise? Can I see your hand? Oh, come on, somebody. This is the healthy church in the first service. <laughs> come on, like to work out? All right, you can put it down. How many of you would say, by a showing of hands, that uh, you do not like to work out, you don't enjoy exercise? Can I see your hand? Come on, don't lie in church now. All right. <laughs> awesome. You can put it down. Those of you who lifted up your hand the first time, 
the first time. Saying that you like to work out, that you actually enjoy exercise, you are officially dismissed from this service, okay? <laughs> no, for real, you can leave. As a matter of fact, run home, okay? <laughs> because uh, cause I have now found some camaraderie and some commonality with the second group of people. Y'all are my people, okay? I will lift up both hands, both feet, tell the truth, and shame the devil, all right? I do not like to work out. There is absolutely nothing in me that finds enjoyment or pleasure in going to the gym. As a matter of fact, I am theologically and physiologically persuaded that having to work out was as a result of the fall of man. Oh, I'm serious, people. Like, th th there were no gyms in Genesis, okay? There were no ellipticals in the Garden of Eden. You can't have Pilates and have paradise. <laughs> God, in his infinite wisdom and his omnipotent power, created us as perfectly perfect beings. Perfectly perfect. That means Adam had biceps. He had triceps. Uh, he didn't have a one-pack. He had a six-pack. Uh, ladies, ladies, Eve had 0% body fat. 0%. Some of you are like, uh-uh, Robert, what's your scripture for that? Oh, I'll give you some scripture. The Bible says, the Bible says, they were both naked and unashamed. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you only walk around naked if you got it going on. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> it was not, it was not until they took of the forbidden fruit that sin and calories entered into the world. So, I don't like to work out. I don't like to work out. But, but I do work out. I do work out. And the reason I do what I hate is because of what I love, which is to eat, okay? I love to eat. I'm a much better eater than I'm a faster, okay? Don't hate on me. That's my spiritual gift. And whenever I go to the gym, I actually enjoy lifting. I love to lift weights. There's something manly about putting on Old Spice and lifting iron, okay? I like to lift. But how many of you know lifting does not burn the calories? Doesn't burn the calories. You got to do cardio, which means you have to engage in an evil three-letter word called run. Woo, rock. This is my issue, okay? I hate to run. I despise running. I cannot articulate to you how much I hate to run. I hate that run runs with fun because there's nothing fun to me about running, okay? Whenever I do have to run, I convince my mind I have asthma just so I can stop running, okay? <laughs> So, so for me to get on the treadmill is a big deal, and I need a lot of motivation. I got to have a Nike Just Do It t-shirt. I got to have motivational music. I got the eye of a tiger. I need all that just to get on the treadmill. And once I get on the treadmill, you know, I'll start at a good glacial pace, and I'll be going. I'm like, oh, pff, this is easy. This is awesome. I've been running for like, feels like 30 minutes. Then I look at the screen and it's like three minutes. I'm like, my asthma, I can't do this. I'm going to die today. So uh, I've developed this move, I've developed this move as a mechanism for motivation to keep running on the treadmill. True story, as I'm running on the treadmill, just wanting to quit, I will slowly look to the right, and then I will look to the left, and I will just peruse the aisle of other people who are running on their treadmills. And what I am doing is, I'm looking for somebody, anybody, a much older than me body. <laughs> and once I've found that random person, I will lock my eye in on that person and I will say something to them. Not out loud, but in my mind, real loud, I will say to them, Psh, you don't want none. Now, <laughs> let me explain what just happened when I said, Psh, you don't want none. When I said that, unbeknownst to that person, we just entered into a race, okay? Oh, y'all gonna act like I'm the only one that does this, okay? Like, when I said that, this workout just got real, okay? As soon as I made that declaration, the entire gymnasium has now been transformed to the 2017 Olympics, and the first person to get off the treadmill is going home with the silver, and the one that stays on the longest is going home with the gold, and I'm gonna get the gold because I'm a child of God, and I'm American all we do is win 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 no matter what can I get a witness up in here <laughs> true story and, and it really helps me it really helps me when the person is right next to me because then I can see their screen and see exactly how fast they're going you know what I'm saying so it's even so if they're on level six I'm on level six Point one. And uh, if they speed up, I'm going to speed up. If they go on an incline, I'm going to go on an incline. If they stop and take a break, 
I'm going to stop and take a break. Oh, yes, I'm not going to keep running while they stop and take a break. That's cheating. You can't cheat in the Olympics. This is a global event. So whatever they do, I will do it. Then I'll wait for it. And as soon as they press stop and get off the treadmill, I will speed mine up to the fastest level because you got to sprint to the finish line. Then I'll press stop, jump off, grab my towel and say, I got the gold and rejoice in my sweet victory. <laughs> I wish I was lying to you, but I'm being so real with y'all this morning. As a matter of fact, I beat a guy a couple of weeks ago, a random guy, and I beat him bad too. And I saw him in the locker room afterwards. I said, hey man, how are you? He said, I'm good. How are you? I said, I'm great. In fact, I'm golden, loser. It was awesome. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you laugh. You laugh because it's, it's funny. It's, it's comical when you talk about comparing yourself to other people in the gym, comparing yourself to other people when you're doing exercise. But how many of you know it's not so funny when you talk about comparing yourself to other people in life? And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, what I'm afraid today's message mandates is that you introspectively ask the critical question, who are you racing? Who are you racing? I'm just wondering who in your life have you set your eye on and you are running your race according to their pace instead of doing the thing that God has called you to do. Instead of chasing after the purpose and the assignment and the destiny that God has placed on your life. Ooh, I just came to warn you today that the comparison game is a dangerous game to play. I don't know whether you notice this or not when you're running on a treadmill, which is another reason why I hate running. Have you noticed on a treadmill you're doing a whole lot of moving? whole lot of breathing, whole lot of sweat, but you ain't going anywhere. You are in the exact same position the entire time. What a beautiful metaphor for comparing yourself to other people. Because whenever you compare yourself to somebody else, all you end up doing is exerting a lot of psychological, emotional, and spiritual energy trying to keep up and compete with somebody you were never called or created to be. And at the end of all of it, you realize, I'm in the exact same position I was when I first got started. I'm preaching better than y'all are talking in here today. As a matter of fact, I I'm just exercising something a great mentor in my life told me that I'll never forget. He said, Robert, whenever you preach, just preach from your weakness because you'll never lack for material to preach. <laughs> preaching from my weakness today because I found in my own life, as I've been running the race God has set before me, I have this inner proclivity and tendency to look at the people in the lanes beside me. Hear me, church, I am convinced that comparison, comparison is the number one destroyer of destiny. I am convinced that the enemy's number one weapon of mass distraction and mass destruction is to get you to compare yourself to somebody else. It's his number one weapon. Because after all, that's what got him kicked out of heaven. Satan, Lucifer, you know he used to be on the praise and worship team of heaven. It all started with comparison. He was created to be a conduit, to be an expression of God's glory. But he starts comparing himself to God and said, I will exalt my throne above the most high. And that's what got him fired and dismissed. And now his job is to kill, steal, and destroy from you and I. And that's exactly what comparison will do. It will kill your joy. It will steal your peace. It will suffocate your sanity. Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is like cancer to contentment. You know, I love the Apostle Paul, uh, the artist formerly known as Saul. It's funny to me. And <laughs> he wrote a majority of your New Testament. And I love when he starts bringing order and structure to the church at Corinth because he warns them emphatically about the danger of comparison. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Look what Paul says. He says, for we dare not, we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Paul says, you are stupid, you are foolish, you are cray-cray if you are playing the comparison game. And do you know why comparison is not wise? Hear me today. Because comparison will consistently cloud the clarity of God's call on your life. Ooh, that was so nice, I'm going to say it twice. Comparison will consistently cloud the clarity of God's call on your life. Meaning, if you ever want to be confused about what God has called you to do, then just start comparing yourself to what other people have been called to do. 
But first of all, let's just establish today that there has been a call that has been placed on your life. Oh, come on. I hope you know that at the Rock Church, there is a call, a call on your life. You do know that Jesus did not come from heaven to earth. Get up on a cross and die. Get up from the grave just so we could have cute church services, sing songs off a screen like it's Christian karaoke, and you sit on your blessed assurance and hear an inspirational word. No, but there's actually a purpose to your life. There's an assignment on your life. There is a destiny on your life that you have to complete before you take your last breath. As a matter of fact, you may as well check your pulse. If you got a pulse, that pulse is proof positive that God is not through with you yet. That's why the enemy couldn't kill you. That's why you're still here because there is a call and a purpose and an assignment on your life. I feel like preaching now. Come on, somebody say, I'm called. Ooh, say it like you got power. Say, I'm called. There is a call on your life, a call, a divine call. You do know there's a difference between a career and a calling. Ooh. See, a career is what you get paid to do. A calling is the thing you were made to do. It's the thing when you do it, you say, Whoo, I was born to do this right here. There is a call on your life. Not only that, God has given you everything you need to accomplish your call. Ooh, that shouting stuff right there. To think, to think that everything I need to do what God has called me to do, it's already in me. Everything you need to do what God has called you to do, it is already in you. You don't have to look outside of yourself. You don't have to hate on anybody. You don't have to be jealous of anybody. He has given you everything you need to accomplish your specific call. If you don't have it, that means you didn't need it to do what God has called you to do. That means if you were supposed to be taller, guess what? He would have made you taller. If you were supposed to be faster, he would have made you faster. If you were supposed to sing, he would have given you a voice. If you were supposed to be on Dancing with the Stars, he would have given you more rhythm. If you were supposed to be America's Next Top Model, he would have made you cuter. Hello. If you were supposed to be black, he would have made you black. If you were supposed to be white, he would have made you white. If you were supposed to be Latino, buenos dias, he would have made you Latino. You got everything you need on the inside of you stop complaining to the master about the pieces you didn't get and just start praising him and thanking him that you're a masterpiece oh somebody ought to give God some praise and thank him for making you the way he made you that's the best praise you got I dare you to thank him for making you the way he made you hallelujah I am who God says I am. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Hallelujah. You're a masterpiece. You're a masterpiece created by the greatest artist who is God. Be happy to be who God created you to be. Ooh, I feel this message. Let me calm down and interrupt this regularly scheduled sermon so that you can engage in a verbal exercise. <laughs> Would you just say this, say this, say I, I am a masterpiece. Yes. Come on, say it like you believe it. Say I, I I am a masterpiece. Come on, say it like you had your coffee this morning. Say, I, I am a masterpiece. I'm telling you, if that just got in your heart, really got sunken in your heart, I promise you that would change the way you walk into a room. That would change the way you feel about yourself. You wouldn't lose your joy so easily and walk into church looking like you constipated and been sucking on lemons. If you knew that you were a masterpiece created by the greatest artist who is God. As a matter of fact, if you got ridiculous radical faith, when you go to work tomorrow or wherever you're going, I dare you to take some velvet rope and just put it around you. And when people say, why you got that velvet rope? Say, oh, you didn't know? I'm a masterpiece. There was a God that created me. Picasso can't touch him. Leonardo da Vinci has nothing. The God that formed me. I am a masterpiece. Ooh. Are y'all recording this? I'm going to watch it later. It's blessing me. The <laughs> masterpiece created by the greatest artist who is God. When I tell you you're a masterpiece, please hear me today. Don't get it twisted. Uh, that is not preacher hype. That's not self-help talk. You understand that's the word of God. Yeah. You don't believe me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10 declares, For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us. Watch this. Long ago. That God is a strategic God. And he has already marked out a path and a lane for all of us to run in. And all you have to do, all you got to do is stay in your lane and keep your eyes on Jesus. <laughs> all you got to do is stay in your lane and keep your eyes on Jesus. I just made faith and Christianity so simple. All you got to do is stay in your lane 
and keep your eyes on Jesus. That's actually my entire message. The rest is just fluff. I came all the way from Dallas, Texas to San Bernardino to tell you two things. Stay in your lane and keep your eyes on Jesus. That's all I got. Literally all I got. That's all I got. Matter of fact, I'm done. God bless you. It's been so good being with you today. Thank you. <laughs> it sounds so simple. And it sounds so elementary. But I'm finding that is the most difficult thing for people to do. Just to stay in their lane and keep their eyes on Jesus. That is difficult for people to do. Come on, let's just think practically this morning. How many of you have ever been stuck in traffic? I mean, what am I talking about? We in California. Okay, when you're in traffic. Isn't it funny and a phenomenon, whenever you're stuck in traffic, you always, always feel like the lanes beside you ah, are the ones that are moving faster. And what do you do? What do you do? You almost wrecked your car trying to get in somebody else's lane and you would have been better off just staying in your lane. God told me to tell you, don't wreck your life trying to get in somebody else's lane. Just stay in your lane and keep your eyes on Jesus. Ooh, your lane. Your lane. Your. Ooh, your. Ah, your lane. Your, your lane, what an incredible concept. What a brilliant notion that God and his benevolence would be kind enough to give me my own lane. My own lane. You have a lane. I have a lane. You do know that lanes are comprised of two lines, right? Two lines make a lane. There's one line here and one line here. Sound effects always make preaching better, okay? So one line here and one line here. Two lines make a lane. And you have to stay within the parameters of the two lines. Two lines make a lane. Interestingly enough, every single one of us, we have two destinies. There is a duality to your destiny. One destiny is universal. There's a universal destiny for every believer, and that destiny is this, to become more and more like Jesus every single day. That is the universal destiny of every believer, to become more like him. If we could just think like Jesus, love like Jesus, forgive like Jesus, show grace like Jesus, go to your family reunion like Jesus, <laughs> go to your job like Jesus, be a dad like Jesus, be a mom like Jesus. That is the universal destiny of every believer to be conformed to the image of his dear son. So if you're sitting in this room today going, duh, what am I supposed to do with my life? I just told you, <laughs> become more and more like Jesus every single day. But you do have another destiny, and it is not universal, it is unique. And that is you are to become unlike anybody God has ever created. Because when God made you, he broke the mold. Everybody else is already taken. You may as well just be you. Do you, boo-boo, just do you. <laughs> so every day you wake up, that's how you run your race. Every day I wake up, I'm trying to be more and more like Jesus and unlike anybody God has ever created. More and more like Jesus and unlike anybody God has ever created. More and more like him and less and less like them. And when you run your race like that with your eyes on him, he gives you the strength, the fortitude, the velocity to finish your race. Come on, is this helping anybody in here today? This is why... This is why once you put your faith in Jesus, you can never say you're just anything. Like that vernacular has to go out the window. You can't say I'm just this. Whatever you do, whatever your occupation, your vocation, that becomes your lane through which you can give God glory. So you can't say statements like, well, I'm just a school teacher. No, you're not just a school teacher. You're actually God's representative in the classroom. So the classroom can see what does Jesus look like when Jesus teaches a class? That's your lane. You can't say, well, Robert, I'm just a nurse. You are not just a nurse. You are God's representative in the medical field. So the medical field can see what does Jesus look like when Jesus gives a flu shot. That is your lane. You can't say, well, Robert, I'm just a lawyer. You are not just a lawyer. You are God's representative in the law field. So the law field can see what does Jesus look like when Jesus takes your case. Wherever you are, that's your lane. I think I got to stay right here because I can hear somebody talking. I can hear somebody saying, Robert, you ain't talking to me. You ain't talking to me because I'm just a hairstylist. Girl, you are not just a hairstylist. You are God's representative in that hair salon. So the hair salon can see what does Jesus look like when Jesus puts weave or extensions in somebody's hair. Wherever you are, that's your lane. That's your lane. And the challenge of life is to run your race with your eyes on him. Because the day, the day you start running your race like this, the day you start running your race like this, let me just prophesy to you, there is a crash in your future. <laughs> See, lot. Um, no wonder, no wonder Saul had such a huge crash because comparison caused him to shift all of his focus, all of his attention on David. Now, make no doubt about it, there was a season in Saul's life where he was in his lane and he was running his race. 
Oh, understand, Saul was the first king of Israel. He was anointed and appointed by God to be king. I love when the Bible starts talking about Saul because the Bible uses very picturesque language. It says that he looked like a king. It says that he stood a head and shoulders above any other person. In fact, the Bible says he was good looking. Come on, somebody. When the Bible says you're good looking, <laughs> can't nobody tell you ugly, okay? <laughs> nobody. You just tell them, read the word. You already know. <laughs> this selfie is for you, so... <laughs> He looked like a king and he talked like a king and he had king swag and, and God just blessed him. God blessed him to be the king. Man, I found even in my own life, you got to be real careful with the blessing of God. Ooh, be careful when you're singing, bless, bless. Be careful with the blessing of God because if the brightness of the blessing ever blinds you to the blesser, it is no longer a blessing. It has become a curse. And the brightness of the blessing blinded Saul to the blesser, so much so, he was more concerned with being the king than he was with worshiping the king of kings. He was more concerned with keeping his position than he was with chasing after God's presence, so God had to remove the kingship away from him. But there was another young boy out on the outskirts of Jerusalem, and all he cared about was being in the presence of his God. He didn't care about a title, he didn't care about a position, he didn't care about likes on Facebook or retweets, all he cared about was being in the presence of his is God even after his family alienated him and ostracized him and said man just go watch the stanky sheep he is out there with the stanky sheep smiling and playing love songs to his God on his harp until one day his dad sends him a text message and says hey can you go to the battlefield and bring your brothers a ham and cheese sandwich and when he gets to the battlefield with a ham and cheese sandwich he sees a giant who is big enough to eat hay and dumb enough to enjoy it and he says wait a minute who is this uncircumcised Philistine oh I love David he's gangster because that's Christian cussing right there okay that is classic Christian cussing he said who is this uncircumcised Philistine he said no I'm not gonna be quiet y'all gonna let him talk about my God in front of everybody oh no is there not a cause where is my slingshot hey let me tell you something Goliath catch me outside how about that catch me outside oh David said not on my watch Woo. He says, somebody let me know, what do you get for knocking this giant out? Because I'm about to knock him out. They said, David, you want to know what you're going to get for knocking him out? You're going to get the king's daughter in marriage, and you will never have to pay taxes again in your life. David said, what? Somebody hold my harp. He said, you come at me with sword and spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord, the God of these armies whom you have defiled this day. I will cut off your head and feed your flesh to the wild beast of the field and the birds of the air. And today the world will know there is a God in Israel. Oh, I feel a praise break right there. Somebody ought to praise God and thank him that giants do die, that giants fall down knocked him out you know the story releases that rock from a slingshot Goliath hit the ground and church the day Goliath hit that ground David rose up it was a destiny moment you do know that all moments in your life are not created equal that there are some destiny moments where everything shifts where everything changes in fact I pray today I pray today that this would be a destiny moment for somebody where everything changes in this moment this was a destiny moment for David in an instant he was catapulted from obscurity into notoriety in an instant everybody knew his name he's trending on the internet now they're talking about David David he's our man if he can't do it nobody can kids are re-watching the fight on YouTube he's on the cover of every Wheaties box kids are going up to the and saying dad I gotta get those David sneakers they drop next week you know they're gonna be sold out I mean this is a big moment for David he's finally arrived he's doing interviews on ABC NBC TBN CNN HIJK Elemental P the whole alphabet wants to talk to David now he can't go anywhere without paparazzi showing up and TMZ coming on the scene everybody wants a selfie with David now because you understand when he defeated Goliath he became a rock star literally rock star I'm just trying to keep you awake and engaged. This is a big moment for David. He has finally arrived. He's defeated the giant. He's cut off his head. The wicked witch is dead. The game is over. The buzzard is sounded. And the fat lady has finally sung. <laughs> Only problem is Saul didn't like what the fat lady was singing. <laughs> One of the fat lady, just a group of ladies. And uh, here's what they sang. Saul has killed his thousands. David his tens of thousands and when Saul heard that when that got in his spirit he went from running his race like this to fixing his eyes onto David 
Therefore, Saul is a case study of the downward spiral of what comparison will always do to your life. Because comparison is always the beginning of the end. Okay. All of that was my introduction. <laughs> Y'all laughing, but I'm being honest. Uh, I wanted to get you to this place and show you how Saul's speech, his little speech, teaches us how comparison always starts. Note what Saul says after the ladies sing their song. He goes, huh, y'all gonna credit David with tens of thousands, but me with only thousands? Wait a minute, hold up, 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 hold up. Y'all are gonna credit David, Psh, little old David with his nappy head, with tens of thousands, but me with only thousands? You hear it? Hear how it starts? Comparison always starts with this phrase, but me. He, but me. He, but me. See, Saul can't separate David's life from his life, nor can he separate David's success from his success. He immediately connects what's going on with David back to him. He, but me. Ooh. Have you ever met a but me person? These are the people that see everything in life through the lens of but me. I call them but me people because no matter what's going on with somebody else, they will find some way to connect it back to them because they are always thinking about themselves. I call them but me people. Ooh. Come on, you English majors are acutely aware of the fact that but is a conjunction. Conjunction, junction. Come on, somebody watch Schoolhouse Rock. What's your function? <laughs> Hooking up phrases and clauses and making them sound right. That's what some people do in life. They connect what's going on with somebody else all the way back to them. Oh, that's good for you. What about me? Did you think about me? Did they talk about me? Did they consider me? What about me? What about me? What about me? You talk about me? Y'all talking about me? What about me? What about me? What about me? Did you think about me? What about me? Just their butt keeps getting in the way. You ever met a butt me person? Okay, you need a visual. Let me give you a visual here at the Rock Church. It's kind of light, so kind of bright. I don't know if we can get it closer. I'm talking about the people that see everything in life through the lens of but me. These are my but me glasses, okay? Now, if I fall off the stage in this moment, please don't laugh because I cannot see anything right now because I am completely blinded by but me. And can I tell you, church, nothing will stop you from running your race. Nothing will trip you up in this walk of faith like a but me attitude. Because how many of you know the focus of your life is not supposed to be on you. You're supposed to fix your eyes on Jesus us so you can run the race he set before you if you'll get your eyes off of you you can do what God has called you to do oh but no wonder we keep falling and tripping so many people got on the but me glasses no wonder you can't see how blessed you already are because you got on the but me glasses no wonder you keep losing your joy and your peace because you got on the but me glasses. Oh, a but me attitude is the worst attitude to have because it will steal your joy. It will steal your peace. I mean, there's nothing worse than calling a but me person and telling them about your praise report. Oh, oh don't tell a but me person about what God did in your life. You know why? Because they can't celebrate what's going on with you without connecting it back to them. You call a but me person up, you be like, "Woo, God is good. He's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I finally got a raise on my job. Isn't that great? And the but me person will go, yeah, that's great. For you, but me. Oh, God, how you going to give him a raise that I ain't got a raise on my job? I've been coming to church longer than him. I've been giving in every offering. God, you know my money is funny and my change is strange. How are you going to bless him before me? Oh, but me. Ooh, but me. Take the joy out of the most celebratory moment. Celebratory moment. Nothing worse than a but me bridesmaid. I mean, come on, this is a wedding. Everybody's smiling. White doves have been released from a cage. Celine Dion is playing in the background. And there's the but me bridesmaid hating in the back time out. Oh, but me. God, how you going to give her a man and you still ain't giving me a man yet? Oh, you know how many nights I had to hold myself every night sending roses to myself every night watching the notebook on Netflix by myself? Oh, but me. So has got on the but me glasses and boy is it robbing him of his peace and his joy oh can I go a little bit deeper this is first service we gotta ask ourselves as thinking cognitive individuals who started the comparison because I don't think we can completely castigate Saul because who started the comparison who started it you'll know it wasn't Saul that started it Saul didn't come in one day and said oh woe is me David, he's killed his tens of thousands, but little old me, I've killed my thousands. No, Saul, Saul didn't start it. It wasn't even like David started it. 
We can understand frustration then if David came in braggadociously saying, ha, ha, ha. Saul, guess what? Started from the bottom. I'm coming right there. I'm about to take your throne. We could understand that. No, this was an external voice that placed the comparison on him. If I didn't have to already fight the inner voice that wants to compare myself to other people, what do you do when somebody else has placed the weight of comparison on you? Come on, somebody. Some of you have been there. Some of you are there right now. Sometimes parents are the worst culprits. Why can't you be more like your sister? She always keeps her room clean. And you walk by your sister's room and she's sitting on her bed that's been perfectly made. And you're like, I hate you. Oh, come on. Can we be real? It's frustrating when people compare you to somebody else. Oh, come on. Can we be real? Come on. Some of you ladies have been there. You've been there. You spent all day slaving in that kitchen, cooking in that kitchen all day for your man to come home and have the nerve and the audacity to eat the macaroni cheese and go, mm, you know, my, my, my mama don't make macaroni and cheese like this. <laughs> Call your mama to come make you some macaroni and cheese. Oh, come on. Can we be real? It's frustrating. When people compare you to somebody else. So let's give Saul just a moment to be human. <laughs> and I almost empathized with Saul and I felt bad with him for him. Because I said, that's messed up. They're comparing his number to David's number. But then I started studying. Ooh, and I did an etymological exploratory on this biblical pericope. <laughs> and I found out that's not what the ladies were doing at all. Don't miss this. On surface level, you think they're comparing Saul's number to David's number, right? Because what do they say? Saul, you've killed your, David, your. So you think they're comparing Saul's number to David's number, right? And so did I, because I'm better in English than I am in Hebrew. But when I started studying the text, I found out that is not what the ladies were doing at all. When you study the text in its original language, you find out that almost always, whenever there was a verse of scripture like this, they would almost always amplify the second number mentioned, not necessarily because of its numerical value, but more so to intensify the totality of what was being said for literary impact. I'm gonna give you some blues clues and make it real plain, okay? <laughs> we do the same thing today, we do the same thing today. If you ask me for money, I can say, hey, don't ask me for money, ask my friend for money. He's got hundreds and thousands of dollars. What did I do? I amplified the second number mentioned. I would not say he's got hundreds and cents. I said he's got hundreds and I didn't even give you an exact amount. I am using that as an idiom so you can know the weight of his wealth. That's exactly what the ladies are doing here. They're not even comparing Saul's number to David's number. You know what the ladies are really saying in the original language? This is all they're saying. Saul has killed a bunch and David has killed a bunch. We just glad they all dead. That's all they're saying. They're not even comparing Saul's number to David's number. Why can't Saul see that? got on the button me glasses and when you are the focus of your life when you're always thinking about you hear me you'll get offended when you shouldn't get offended you'll get upset when you shouldn't get upset I know that Facebook post was about me no you're just always thinking about you that's why you thought it was about you because but me or rob you of your joy and your peace if somebody comes to play softly behind me what are some signs that you have on the but me glasses I think there's some signs number one if you can't celebrate the successes of other people, you got on the butt me glasses. If you are stingy with your compliments and you think to compliment or commend somebody else somehow takes something from you, you got on the butt me glasses. If there is anybody in your life, anybody in your life that secretly you would find joy or happiness in their failure that's the person you're racing and you got on the butt me glasses Ooh, it's quiet in the church today <laughs> and can we be honest isn't it so easy to put on the butt me glasses isn't it so easy come on i've done it i'm preaching this to you because i had to preach it to me first it's so easy in our culture today to put on the butt me glasses especially in our culture today this culture of social media huh? social me dia let me get that tomorrow because you got so many devices where you can see what everybody has, what everybody's doing with a click of a button. We are constantly inundated with everybody else's life. Facebook, Facebook Live, Instagram, Instagram Live, Twitter, Snapchat. We are always seeing everybody else's life. And if you're not careful, it will make you hate yours. Huh. Isn't it funny how our awareness accelerates our discontentment? 
Can you imagine? Can you imagine how happy you would be if you just didn't know? <laughs> but you got notifications on your smart device <laughs> that's making you stupid. And you're constantly putting on the butt me glasses. Come on, you know, you know. You were so happy with your vacation to Rancho Cucamonga, weren't you? <laughs> you're like, oh, it's gonna be a good vacation. Kids, get in the car, we're going to Rancho Cucamonga. <laughs> So excited till you got on Facebook and saw one of your good friends was going to the Bahamas for their vacation. You're like, oh, but me, I don't want to go to Rancho Cucamonga. I want to be on the beach in the Bahamas. Oh, I hate my life. But me, it's a horrible way to live. And I'm not hating on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. I'm not saying it's sin. I think it's awesome. I'll be on it after the service. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, hear me, church, I really do wonder if the screens on our phones and our computers and our iPads have now become mirrors by which we constantly check for a reflection to see if we measure up to somebody else. And like a scene stolen from Snow White, we all silently echo the words of the Wicked Witch, who, by the way, check the mirror every day just to see mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Only today it's mirror, mirror on Facebook. Tell me how my life should look. <laughs> mirror, mirror on Instagram. Tell me who I really am. We keep checking. Every second. Every minute. All day, every day. Eating lunch. In church. Preach, Robert. This is a good sermon right here. Just wonder what our lives would look like if we reflected on the word of God. Which, by the way, James calls a mirror. Maybe then we could get in our lane with our eyes on him. Come on, somebody, and run the race God has set before us. It's time for the body of Christ to get off of their mark, to get on yours. I'm done, I promise. Every preacher has like seven closes. This is my for real close. I thought I'd just kind of share with you in full disclosure and transparency how this whole message got started. Because I've never been one of those preachers that can preach stuff out that God hadn't hit me upside the head with. In the not too distant past, I had this incredible opportunity to preach at this conference in Sydney, Australia. At the time, it was my assignment to just preach to the youth and the young adults of this conference. Some six or 7,000 young people that were gathering. And I remember being so excited. I was like, ooh, I'm going to Australia. I'm about to preach Jesus and see some kangaroos. This is going to be a good week. And in conjunction with the young people having their conference, there was also the main stage part of the conference. And for the main stage part of the conference, some 30,000 people gather in an arena in Sydney, Australia for main stage. And the people that have preaching main stage are people who are really struggling to get their ministries off the ground. Uh, people like Bishop T.D. Jakes, Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, and Rick Warren. So I said, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to preach to the youth and the young adults and listen to these great men and women of God preach. And, as so I'm sitting in that arena, and my wife was there with me, my wife and I knew something that the other 30,000 people did not know yet. And that was just before we'd arrived to Sydney to just preach to the youth and young adults. I'd actually received an invitation to preach main stage at that conference the next year. So I'm sitting in that arena, and I'm looking around. I'm kind of taking everything in. And all of a sudden, they show the promotional video for the next year's conference. And again, it's all these big names, big names, huge names, big names. Abraham Lincoln was one of the speakers they were going to have at this conference. And then all of a sudden, my name comes up on the screen, and the pastor, the leader of the conference, he almost had to qualify. He said, there's one name you probably didn't recognize on the list. He said, it's Robert Madu. He said, it'll be one of the youngest speakers we've ever had preach main stage. Then he pauses, true story, and goes, you know what? I think I might let you get a preview of his preaching on this stage in this arena this week. Now, that would have been cool. That would have been cool if I wasn't finding out in that moment with the other 30,000 people in the arena. Immediately, my heart went down into my foot. I start sweating. I see the pastor after the service. He goes, did you hear my announcement? I go, yes, I did. He goes, true story. He goes, I'm thinking tomorrow after T.D. Jakes preaches, you could get up and preach for like 10 minutes as a preview for the upcoming conference. He goes, what do you think about that? I went, yeah, <laughs> that would be great. Went to the hotel room that night, true story, fell on the ground in the fetal position, tears coming down my face. I can't do this, I can't do this. Why would he tell me this now? He could have told me this 30 years ago. What's wrong with it? You 
ever had one of those moments where you felt so intimidated by an opportunity that your voice went to Mickey Mouse range, just so scared? My wife is the best. She is my CEO, my chief encouragement officer. She said, babe, it's okay. You can do it. You can do it. I said, no, I can't. No, I can't. Called my dad up for some support. You know, my dad is from Nigeria. He came from Africa to America, like Eddie Murphy in the movie. And... <laughs> He met my mom, my African dad met my mom who is American. So you know when your father's African and your mother's American, that makes you, which is what I am. And <laughs> called my African dad up for some support. I'll never forget what he said. He said, son, you can do this. Before the foundation of the earth, God knew you would be there. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do this, boy. You can do it. I said, no, I can't. No, I can't. So nervous. So intimidated. Before I got on stage in that arena, had a conversation that I often have with myself. I paused for a moment. I said, wait a minute. Who opened this door? Who opened this door? God did. Who did they ask to speak? Me. I can only be me. So I got up there for 10 minutes. I was me. When I got off of the stage and I was studying this text, I felt like the Holy Spirit impressed upon me a critical question. The Holy Spirit said, Robert, would you like to know the real reason why you fell on the ground in the fetal position with tears coming down your face? I thought to myself, real reason? Uh, no. I know the real reason. There were 30,000 people in the arena. Holy Spirit said, no, that's not the real reason. In fact, the real reason you felt that weight of intimidation is because when you were listening to all those other names speak and preach, you weren't listening to the word of God. You were comparing how they run their race to the way I've called you to run your race. And that's why you felt that weight of intimidation. So let that be the last time that tears come down your face because you're playing the silly comparison game. And why don't you just rest in the fact that I have given you a grace to run your race. There is a grace to run your race. Somebody needs to hear that at the first service at the Rock Church. I said there is a grace to run your race. There is a grace to run your race. Come on, somebody. I got an announcement I'm glad to make this morning. I hope it don't stop me from coming back. But can I tell y'all, I'm a horrible T.D. Jakes. I am the worst Joe Osteen you have ever seen. I'm not a good Billy Graham. I'm a terrible Rick Warren. Y'all know I'm not a good Joyce Meyer. But there's one thing I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. I am the best Robert Madu you have ever seen in your life. Come on, somebody. I gotta be me. You gotta be you. This is your moment to get in your lane with your eyes on Jesus and run your race. Come on, somebody give God some praise in this place today. Hallelujah. Get on your mark. Get on your mark. This is your time. Everybody stand that can. This is your moment. You say, God, I'm shifting my focus, shifting my perspective back to you. I'm telling you, he's given you a grace to run your race. Can I ask every head be bowed, every eye be closed. Jesus, I thank you today for your word. God, your word truly is a light unto our path. It's a lamp unto our feet. Jesus, I pray that the word today brought revelation and illumination. Jesus, I pray for my brother, I pray for my sister, who the enemy has been beating them up with the weight of comparison. They've been trying to be their brother, trying to be their sister, trying to be this or that. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to release over this house today the grace for us to run our race. We would be confident in who you created us to be. We would run our race with passion because our eyes are fixed on you. His heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're in here today and you'd be so honest to say, you know what, Pastor Robert, man, this, this is for me. Some of you, if you're truly honest, for years, this weight of comparison has been on you. And I believe God just sent me here today just to tell you to do what this song that's playing behind me says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If you're in here today and you say, you know what, I need to fix my eyes back on him because I've been playing the comparison game. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand? I need to know who I came for today. Say, that's me. That's me. Yeah. 
Hands are going up all over this place. Just lift it up, put it right back down. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you. Your freedom comes to every single person today. In our lane, running our race. Heads still bowed, eyes still closed. If you lift it up, if you could, as heads are bowed, say, you know what, Pastor Robert, I've never even taken that first step, which is to surrender my life to Jesus. You know you are disconnected from God. You just need to get in the race in the first place. Say, Jesus, I'm coming home today. I'm tired of doing life by myself. I need you. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I've never surrendered my life to Jesus, but today I need to give him my life. If that's you, I just want you to lift up your hand right where you are. You know who you are. Say, that's me. I need to give him my life. Just lift it up high enough and long enough to where I can see it. Can you lift it up? Say, that's me. Yeah. See that hand. Thank you. See that hand. Hallelujah. Anybody else? I see that hand. Hallelujah. I'm going to do something. This is not to embarrass anybody. This is to actually empower you. If you're in here today and you lifted up your hand that second time saying, you know what? I just need to surrender my life to him. When I count to three, I'm going to ask you to do something so bold and so brave. I want you to get out of your seat and come find a place right here at this altar. You don't have to worry about what anybody else is going to think. As a matter of fact, as soon as the first person starts coming, this place is going to start giving God praise because that's exactly what the angels in heaven are doing whenever somebody says, I'm coming home. But if you lifted up your hand that second time, or you should have lifted up your hand, say, you know what? I need to surrender my life to Jesus. When I count to three, I want you to come. One, this is your moment. Two, Jesus loves you so much. Three, would you come? Come. If you lifted up your hand that second time, come on. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. From the back to the side. Come on. Come on. Wherever you are, come on. This is your moment. This is your moment. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Coming home today. Come on, church. Can we give God praise in this place? Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Bless you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Hallelujah. God bless you. He loves you, man. It's a purpose. It's a call on your life. That's why the enemy comes against you, because he knows that God has already marked out a path for you to run in. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Hallelujah. 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 I always like to pause for a few more minutes, because I know how the enemy works. He likes to tell you, oh, it's too late. You can't go down there now. People are going to be looking at you. No, it's not too late. This is your moment. You say, that's me, man. I need to give him my life. I'm going to wait just a few more moments. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's what I want us to do all over this place. We're going to join you. Can we just lift up our hands all over this place, especially those of you here at the front? I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but I just want you to say it from your heart. In fact, we're all going to say it as one big family today. Can you say this? Say, dear Jesus, thank you so much for dying on a cross getting up from the grave for me Jesus today I confess with my mouth I believe in my heart that you are the son of God you're coming back for me forgive me of my sin wash me clean make me new from this moment forward I'm walking with you no more comparison I'm in my lane. My eyes are on you. Jesus, I trust you to give me the strength and the grace to run my race. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, can we give Jesus the biggest hand clap of praise today? Come on, you can do better than that. Come on. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Those of you here at the front, Pastor Noel, he's going to take you to the side. He just wants to encourage you, give you some next steps. Come on, can we celebrate them that made decisions today? Hallelujah. Pastor Dan, God bless you, Rock Church. Come on, did you guys appreciate the word of God?